Thank you for that kind introduction. It's, it's really great to be here, especially with such an important topic on the agenda. I was really pleased to be asked to join. Um, this is an area that, that USAID sees as incredibly important to the work we do around the world. I'm going to um, speak about the context of, of our seed investments within Feed the Future, which is the U.S. government's global hunger and food security initiative. It's a whole of government initiative led by USAID, but we're joined by 10 other U.S. government agencies in implementing this work around the world. Um, we see seed system investments as, as really core to our work on increasing the enabling environment for agriculture. Obviously, it's one of the, the things that smallholder farmers need. They need access to seeds. And without functional seed markets, they really can't um, do the business of agriculture that they need to do. And so as we think about really transforming agricultural systems around the world, seed systems, functional seed systems, are really integral to that work. I'm going to really just touch on a few highlights of the work we do in the time I have today. It's not a comprehensive sort of overview of, of what we are doing. I wanted to acknowledge that the slides I'll be presenting were mostly compiled by my colleague Mark Heisinger sitting over here. So you can also find him after the seminar if you want to really delve deeper into some of the issues that I'll be presenting. And that much of the work also was done in collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I think. This audience probably knows more about this than I do. The various seed sector constraints that are out there, they range from capacity issues to financing issues. We have to think about the farmer's awareness about different kinds of seeds, the supply of seeds, the capacity not just of the public sector, the NARS, where a lot of the breeding work is happening, but of course of the, of the private seed companies, as we just heard. Um, but, but basically, the bottom line is that these constraints are many and varied. and the seed sectors where we work in developing countries around the world are insufficiently developed for the most part and they fundamentally often don't serve the needs of farmers. I'm going to go through a, a few complex slides here. I won't try to cover everything in the slide but I wanted to give you just a few sort of highlights of, of some of the studies that, that we've supported um, looking at, at seed systems and, and sort of how they function, what works, what doesn't and, and the nature of those systems. This is the outcome of a, a study on, on early generation seed. What the highlights here are that, that different seed sectors, different seed businesses really fall into different categories. You have some that are more dominated by the private sector where they're really offering a private good. You have some that really are more anchored in the public sector and are offering public goods. You have some that are, that are hybrids where you have public-private partnership models are most effective. But just as an example, hybrid maize, vegetable seeds, often private goods. Um, crops like millet, sorghum, or teff, often public goods. Um, and the, the pathways to scale of new seed varieties really depend on where they fall in this and that can inform decisions as to where the public and private sectors should be investing. Um, I just wanted to note that some crops simply won't be attractive to private sector because they don't currently perhaps have a viable business model. But that doesn't mean that those crops aren't fundamentally and extremely important to smallholder farmers. And so part of the challenge here is understanding where different crops fall so that you can design your capacity building efforts, your, your seed, strength, seed system strengthening efforts um, to really ensure that you're meeting the needs of all farmers and that there are going to be uh, seed sector models that will work for crops like millet and sorghum, which are crucial to food security in Africa, and also for crops like hybrid, hybrid maize, which can really can generate a lot of income and, and start to transform agricultural systems. Um, again, a fairly complex slide, just some examples of different kinds of, of seed sector business models and, and where you can have public and, and, and private players entering into this. Some crops um, sweet potato in the United States, for example, there's a strong role for the public sector in some of the early stages of, of, the, seeds, of the seed pathway. Um, looking at, at rice in Indonesia, for example, you have some international ag research investment in, in the early stage R&D. You have really role for the public sector as additionally, and then um, you have roles for public-private sectors in, in public-private si sector partnerships and ensuring that those seeds eventually reach farmers. So again, this is just to sort of illustrate the diversity of the models, which really, again, are important to informing our activities as a donor investing in, in the seed sector space and in strengthening seed sectors, thinking about what capacities are needed, what policies are needed, what regulations are needed. Obviously, those are going to be uh, different, and perhaps there's a great need for them to be flexible, thinking about the fact that you have very different kind of crops um, and seeds entering those seed, those seed systems. Obviously, one model, one vision of a seed sector um, business model is not going to fit all crops. 
So getting here to, to sort of what we're hearing out, out in the field, what are the various uh, policy, policy constraints that, that impact um, seed sectors and, and the availability of seed to farmers? Um, basically, this boils down to the restrictions on, on when varieties can be released, restrictions on who can release those varieties, what role some countries mandate, of course, that the public sector has a role in either early generation or, or foundation or breeder seed, in what time frame are there mandatory requirements for series of, of tests that must take place, even if it's a variety that has been tested, for example, in neighboring countries. So a huge realm of, of policy constraints that must be addressed and, and that we have to think about as we're working with, with partner governments and in, in, in helping them to sort of really think about how they would like to change their own seed systems to make them work better for farmers. So thinking again of, of them, that categorization of different kinds of crops, are they going to be private sector dominant crops, are they going to be public sector dominant crops, then that of course um, informs the various kinds of recommendations that, that emerge from that work to government and donors as they work in this space. Um, thinking about private sector dominant crops, there's going to be a need to really remove market distortions, decrease the public role. There's really no, it's not a good use of resources for the, the public sector to be investing tremendous amounts of resources into crops that really um, are better, perhaps a better fit to be taken up by the private sector. Similarly, if you're thinking about public sector dominant crops and, and you have governments investing scarce resources into those crops, they need to be um, very efficient about how they use those resources. And so there's, I won't go into all the different things here, the slides will be available afterwards, but there's of course different roles for government, for donors. Thinking about the public-private collaborations, it's really important to mitigate that demand risk. Um, thinking about perhaps even subsidizing production costs. There's, there's opportunities for investing in the financing, but also really thinking about how you might change policies to make them more conducive to, to crops that are going to come through public-private partnerships, for example. Um, now I'm going to switch to just a, a sort of showcasing kind of some of the highlights of the work that, that USAID is doing in this space under Feed the Future. We have something called the Feed the Future monitoring system. If any of you um, are partners to USAID, you might have had to uh, work with this monitoring system. It's where all the data from all our projects around the world gets entered. There are currently over 500 projects entered into that database, 114 of which are seed related. So you can see it's a pretty substantial area for, for our work under Feed the Future. Um, the, the pie charts here give you some indication of, of our investments in the different areas ranging from commercialization, value chain, research, focused on the enabling environment, um, and then also some sense of, of the different crops that are covered. Um, some projects may cover multiple crops. Maize is obviously a very important crop. Rice, um, pulses is, is large, but also roots, tubers, bananas, vegetables. So it's a pretty broad array. Um, and then finally, the mission versus Washington distinction is, is most of the resources within Feed the Future are programmed by our USAID offices in the field, our field missions. But this is also a substantial area of investment, as you can see, for our centrally managed programs that are managed out of the Bureau for Food Security in Washington. It can sometimes take a broader look across multiple countries or even multiple regions, whereas the, the country-focused work is often or usually obviously focused on the particular country. Um, I won't spend too much time here. I just wanted to note um, that this is coming out of a study that, that was looking at the, the age of different varieties in, in farmers' field, um, on average around 14 years, ranging from 10 to, to over 20 years. This is just, I think we all know this too, but this is really a reminder that seed systems, if, if, if farmers are growing varieties that are super old and they're not tr turning over their, their, their varieties and, and taking advantage of the new technologies that are coming out, that's an indication that the seed system is, is not working very well. Um, and then within our, that subset of 114 seed projects I mentioned, um, 27 address quality or quality, quality declared um, seed. And, and within that, it's worth noting 15 of those projects are, are with CGIR centers. So that's, that's an international public sector institution, obviously very involved in the seed space um, along with us. Then getting into one aspect of, of, of seed, which is thinking about how we scale seeds. Obviously, you need the seed system in place in order to scale seeds, but we can also think about we have programs that are really focused on trying to get seed out to, to farmers more quickly. They cover a range of different regions and crops. I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights here, one of which our signature partnership in this area is with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Uh, working across six countries in Africa. This was part of our commitments to the new alliance, um, commercializing a number of technologies, 
working with small uh, private sector companies, um, doing demo plots, seed fairs, trying to reach really large numbers of households um, through a range of means to ensure that seeds are getting out to farmers. Um, another series of projects that, that were launched just about, I think, a year and a half ago, coming out of our former administrator, Rashad's really emphasis on technology should not be sitting on the shelves. We need to help get these to farmers, and we need to do it in a way that's doing it rapidly and, and quickly and reaching large numbers of farmers. So we put in place um, a series of these sort of rapid scaling projects. I think there are 10 overall. We, we did a number of stakeholder meetings at the beginning. Each project looks a little differently. And through those stakeholder meetings, we came out with the, the various impact pathways that each project is using. So the maize project, for example, working with small and medium seed enterprises, the rice project, um, the stakeholders determined that an investment was needed to um, focus on purifying lines and training companies on quality seed production in West Africa, looking at constraints on early generation seed access, but also thinking about some other points in the value chain. So reducing post-harvest losses can make the investment more profitable and makes it more likely that farmers will, will adopt new varieties. And then finally, an example coming out of our Senegal mission, um, as, I, as I indicated, many of the resources under Feed the Future are in the missions, and, and they are all making investments along with partner country governments and private sector in their seed systems. Um, here, they're funding um, seed labs. They've, they've helped to launch new public-private partnerships to establish seed processing in private facilities, and they're training community farmers who themselves are also producing certified seed. So really good results coming out of this project. And just one note here, we understand that one metric ton of rice seed can produce enough milled grain to meet annual rice consumption of 450 Senegalese. So you can sort of start to see the scale really coming out. I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot.